All right, what's up, people? Welcome to the debuting episode of One Pod Only. We're going to be talking about GFW One Night Only every single month. And uh, this was the right time to do it because the GFW Amped Anthology was kicking off. And, you know, as much as the uh, One Night Only shows have been kind of weak for the most part, I mean, this was a good time to start the podcast, especially since rumors are that in 2018, One Night Onlys are supposed to be a much bigger deal. So, just giving you guys some new content on the channel. So if you're listening for the first time, please hit the subscribe button. This is just one of many things that you're going to hear uploaded on this channel, which is the number one channel for the Global Force Wrestling fan. So joining me right now, and will be joining me each and every month to cover the uh, one night onlys, is my man, Ro the Great. How you doing this morning? Because you are on West Coast time. It's good, man. Just uh, happy to be honest. Hot as hell out here, man. For all my Cali folks, man, <laughs> you know the struggle. <laughs> I've been living in California since I was 20, but uh, I visit there enough to know how that heat gets sometime. And uh, I don't know. This is this is that nice time that I'm in Illinois, and because uh, I've always I either lived in California, Florida, or Illinois. So this is my only cold weather state. And this time of the year, this August, is freaking amazing weather wise. I envy you, man. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to talk uh, one night only here, but um, we had some breaking news today. I've already dropped this on my channel, so I want to give you an opportunity to speak on it, hear your thoughts, because even my, my thoughts have even changed in the last couple hours since I broke the news, just having conversations with people. So um, Alberto El Patron was stripped of the title today. I, I notified you that via text. You didn't know that. Uh, I woke up to it on Twitter, and I had to jump out of bed and go record this. So uh, let me know, uh, what are your thoughts on this whole thing? Yeah, you know, it, uh, um, it blew me by surprise, man, because uh, a lot of times, you know, the news that you break or even some of, you know, the follow to people I follow on Twitter, since, you know, everyone lives on like different uh, times, whether it's East Coast, Central Time, whatever. So I'll get the stuff late. But when I seen it, I looked at it, my initial reaction was, they got a good opportunity to do this right. It's unfortunate, you know, everything that happened, that transpired as far as his issues with Paige. So I felt like with suspending him, you know, at first and foremost, like how I didn't understand how they would actually do the suspension since, uh, um, you know, it was tape. So the fact that they're really getting behind it and taking the belt off him, this gives them the opportunity to do things the right way. And I think they have... Uh, a good opportunity, especially when you look at the match with uh, um, Lashley versus Saito, where the winners can get a title shot of their choosing. You know, you can do that and have that person uh, face Loki and crown a new, you know, unified champion. I'm just happy that, to see somebody outside of uh, Al Patron, you know, be the first. Well, I don't want to say first, but actually going to get to uh, the new titles. Because I think the new titles are debuting uh, this Thursday, correct? Yeah, they're supposed to. Yeah, so, I mean, you know, it, it was a bad situation overall, but it looks like they're trying to do right. But the key thing is, you know, I, I think they should just put the belt on Loki. But if you're going to put the belt on someone, don't let it be somebody debuting, you know, that came from another company. Use some of the talent that they already have, you know? Yeah, I agree. That that's really the dumbest, dumbest, dumbest thing they can do. They can. This is the one night of the year. It really is, with the exception of Bound for Glory or, or no, I'm not even gonna say Bound for Glory Slam Anniversary because this is a the last live show of the year, and yeah, there's a two hour tape delay, but um, this is the one opportunity to do something to have the wrestling world really talking the next morning. So, um, you know. We're, we we know we're not going to get Alberto on TV for the rest of the year now because the tape. I mean, he's not going to be reinstated during the tapings, most likely. I, I guess there's a possibility, but yeah, it it it. it you know what? Because I know a lot of the people when he, <clears throat> excuse me, when he initially debuted, you know, they were sour on it. And you know, for me, I just said I'm willing to give him a shot and stuff. But as long as he's willing to contribute to the company, I didn't like the Superman push they were giving him. Like. I kind of feel in some ways, you know, he kind of, with this feud with LAX, he kind of buried them and stuff. And LAX has been like the hottest act with GFW. So I didn't really like that. And I kind of thought like, well, this opportunity, I said, you know, hopefully Loki goes over and stuff like that. That way, Loki, I mean, uh, not, excuse me, not Loki, but that way LAX can get their comeuppance. But, you know, unfortunately, take the boat off them. This really gives them an opportunity to do things right. 
you know, especially with it being a live show and stuff. So let's hope they don't drop the ball on it. Yep, they can do something really, really huge. So um, let's transition to the GFW Amped Anthology, the uh, one night only. So I was a little confused how this was going to be formatted at first. And for those of you who don't know, and if you, if first of all, in the description here on YouTube, I'm going to put the uh, a link for for the fight app. So it's my promo code. If you guys use that promo code, you'll get a twenty dollar credit. Meaning next month when the pay-per-view comes around, you'll get it for free. So that's going to be in the comments of this video and uh, really recommend that you guys, you guys get it and you check it out. But I was very confused on how they were going to do this because I thought I remember saying them saying, okay, we had 16 episodes in the tank. And uh, I was thinking, okay, well, what are they going to do two episodes per month or three per month? They actually did four episodes in this. So they're four one hour blocks but they're about 40 minutes a piece because of commercial, you know, commercial breaks because this was taped for television. And the way each show is formatted, it's um, a little bit like Ring of Honor. It's two matches and then video packages. The one negative I'll say, dude, um, I'm, I'm, I'm going to assume you agree with me on this. And I haven't even asked you yet. Was that watching the four back-to-back -back episodes, we saw the same video packages what felt like three times but I, we, we saw the video, same video packages at least twice. And they were almost back to back because it was like transitioning out of one show and entering another one. Did that bother you? Yeah, you know what? It, it kind of, you know, the first initial packages, you know, obviously, you know, with the beginning and stuff, it was cool. But then, you know, seeing the same thing over and over, it kind of took me out of it. So it's like, uh, you know, but, uh, um, you know, it, it, it. I'm trying to, I'm sorry, I'm trying to think of the right word to say. Like, I get what they were trying to do, you know what I mean? But, you know, they could have, you know, done a better job of, you know, giving us new stuff instead of the same thing, you know, but it's all good. Yeah, just, just to paint a picture for the people who haven't seen it, think about on the YouTube channel, on the, on the Impact YouTube channel, how they will upload a video package of low-key talking. And then when you turn on Impact on Thursday, you see that same low-key talking. So I've got to the point where I'm starting to ignore a lot of the YouTube content, the YouTube content that they're uploading because I know I'm going to see it on the show. It was different when I thought it was like exclusive to the channel. So that's kind of kind of where, where I'm going with it here. It's like watching it on YouTube and then turning on Impact and seeing the same shit. So they uh they did that uh I mean pretty much with every single video package. They could have edited that a little bit better, but I guess maybe they wanted it a three hour you know wanted it close to three hours so um i'm gonna i'm gonna make a bold statement here i actually thought this was better than anything on tv whether it's impact or lucha underground or ring of honor raw smackdown nxt whatever i actually like this better than anything that's out and i'm confused on how they were not able to strike a tv deal with this you know it's it was one of those things like you know my I, first impression was you know when it's something new a new promotion like i don't know about you if you felt this way but when i heard about it i actually was excited because you know during the time i want to say it was uh, 2015 when they had a debut was it around 2015 when yeah uh, yeah okay you know at that time i was still watching um you know wwe so i felt like hey man i got a I got TNA, I got WWE, I got GFW. It felt like, you know, back in, you know, late 90s where I had WCW, WWF, ECW, the more wrestling, the better. So you could see, like, you know, the uh, the showing, like, the crowd that they drew. And I was just like, wow, like, same thing as you're saying, like, they weren't able to get a TV deal, but I, I've always, and we've talked about this before, I've kind of been a firm believer, like, and after 2010 and stuff like that, like wrestling, like it's hard, you know, to start and start a new promotion, get a TV deal, you know, draw a crowd, all that stuff, you know. So, yeah, like like I, I was thinking just the same thing, like the showing that they had and then the crowd that they drew and stuff like that. It's a damn shame they weren't able to, you know, get a TV deal. Yeah. Um, and it was a better crowd than Ring of Honor has drawn in, in, in the Vegas area. I think we're, we're going to talk about it more throughout the podcast, but there's a certain magic that the vision of Global Force was able to get. 
and uh, or to achieve, I should say. Now, you you guys see now. Granted, Amber Gallows is part of next month's tapings, but you know they had people in the crowd with Bullet Club shirts, and and, uh, and it, it didn't feel out of place because the setting for this global force thing was it doesn't matter where you wrestle, where you're from, you can come here. So it's almost like you know going to a Bellator, Bellator event and seeing someone with a um, UFC shirt or a Bellator shirt, a UFC or going to a sporting event and seeing someone with a shirt from another team. You don't like right now, if you watch impact, you see someone with a bullet club shirt. It's like, Oh my God, why'd they let him in there? You know, <laughs> it's, it's like, they made this like a melting pot. And would you agree? This felt like watching UFC. That was the big magic to it, to me, that it felt like watching UFC with the, the way the announcer, uh, did the play by play and everything like that. I mean, to me, I've just felt like it was more like, you know how you were saying, like, you know, anybody could pretty much show up. I ca I felt like it was more of a wrestling event for all wrestling fans. Like, so whether you're a WWE fan, uh, well, I guess during that time, TNA fan, Ring of Honor, New Japan, like everyone like collectively was there to enjoy the wrestling. There was really no, you know, allegiances. It's like, hey, well, you know, I'm only a fan of this or I'm a fan of that because like you said in the crowd, I even seen... Um, and during that time, I didn't even know who he was, but I haven't seen, there was a guy in the crowd who, uh, um, had a, what's that guy's name? Uh, is it Kenny Omega? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I haven't seen, you know, seen him and stuff like that. So it just seemed like it was an event where all wrestling fans, regardless of what promotions you follow was coming together to, you know, enjoy the event together. You know, there was, you know, none of the, oh, well, you know, we're only fans of this or we're only fans of that and stuff. And as far as announcing, um, to me, it wasn't so much UFC. I kind of felt like it was more of kind of the same old, you know, where you get the face and the heel type dynamic. But it's it's cool. I like that. You know what I mean? Like, I like when you have the one announcer, you know, ch um, talking obnoxious, you know, Lee and, you know, bias about the heel wrestlers and stuff like that. I miss that aspect of wrestling. I feel like we don't get enough of that nowadays. And maybe it's because it's been kind of run into the ground or sometimes you have it where one announcer, it's like a four stacked and stuff, but I kind of miss that. I, I like when you have the, the, you know, baby face announcer and the hill announcer, you know, where the hill announcer is just, you know, cheering for the hill. The hill can cheat, blatantly cheat. And, you know, the, the hill announcer is uh, trying to justify it. Like I miss that dynamic. Yeah. I, I was reading the review on 411 mania. I, I like the reviews a lot because they, they're pretty uh, unbiased. They had a sentence here saying one match in and Sonin and Fees are horrible on com commentary, failing to sell the action and talking in generalities and cliches. I disagree in every possible way. I thought the play-by-play -play was great. It was amazing. It was refreshing. It was focused on the action. The heel color commentary was... It started growing on me. At first, I, I didn't really care for it, but um, I was a really big fan of it. I, I felt like it was just... It wasn't scripted pro wrestling. It was a fight. So if you could imagine uh, New Japan, a uh, U.S. version of U J New Japan. And I know that's kind of what Ring of Honor tries to do, but it's not. It's a, it's like a U.S. version of New Japan. Like when you watch New Japan on Access, you know, it seems like it's a real fighting event, a real sporting event. And that's how this came across to me. And they, they did something with this, which they're trying to do on Impact now. And it's recognizing where people came from so you know if they you say wwe on impact right now it's like oh my god w na wwe name dropping but these guys did it saying okay this guy came from tna he came from wwe he came from they just made it sound like they were paying respect to where the person came from they weren't trying to oh he wrestled all around the world and all that bullshit they just they, they really respect um and point out, hey, this is where the guy started, and this is where he is now. And I see that's where they're trying to go with on Impact. They just can't. It's going to take a while till they can name drop WWE in a in a way where they don't catch backlash for it. But starting with, you know, Sammy Guevara is here from Wrestle Circus, ACH is here from AAW, you know, that kind of stuff. They're they're recognizing where people got their start from or where their home base is. I, I don't, but you know what, to be honest with you, I can't see just because I know, I mean, well, I don't know, but, you know, if you read the sheets, you know, stemming back from uh, when they bought WCW and uh, McMahon fired Jared on TV, 
I can't see Jared like, wanting to acknowledge WWE on Impact programming in any uh, shape or fashion. But I agree with you. I think acknowledging because when you say and when when they do it, and when they say, oh, you know, they uh, in WWE I'm referring to when they say, hey, you know, this this wrestlers, you know, wrestler all around the world has won titles and stuff. What titles? You know, you the, you have to understand that you have casual fans who might only follow you know, your product and stuff like that. So if you're able to acknowledge like, hey, they won world uh, world championship here or stuff like that, you know, it makes them seem like a big deal because otherwise it's like, all right, well, you didn't win anything here. So what you've done before here doesn't matter. And I think that's cool that GFW's, you know, acknowledging like, hey, you know, such and such has wrestled here. You know, they're a former, you know, world champion, junior champion, whatever the case may be. So then to the GFW fans, it's like, okay, this guy or this uh, knockout, this is a big deal. We need to invest in her, you know? And, you know, you can end up going back and, you know, watching old matches and stuff, and then you, be, you end up becoming a fan of that particular wrestler. So I like that idea. I just can't see on GFW, GFW programming them acknowledging you know, uh, WWE. I, I just think just the the hate between Jared and McMahon is real. <laughs> yeah, and and to to your point, titles and uh, championships do matter wherever you win them. I understand it's uh you know pro wrestling is scripted, but this whole unless you won it at WWE level, that's the only way it, that it matters. That's wrong. That's like if you were if you're a lawyer after ten years of working for a, a tiny small law, law firm you work for you start applying for this huge law firm in freaking New York City and they tell you well because you're working for a smaller law firm and you were dealing with family court cases uh you know I don't care that your record is 20 and 0 what you did there doesn't matter it only matters what you do on our platform and it's it's ridiculous. It, granted, it's a smaller scale, but achievements are achievements. So let's get into the show. Um, the first match we get in this entire thing is a uh, PJ Black versus Saya Sonata, and I actually completely forgot that this was for, this is the um, this is in the bracket for the next gen title for the next gen tournament. So just to paint a picture, how different they're doing things. Each tournament is a little bit different. The next gen tournament, it starts off as a bracket of eight people. And then when they move on to the next round, it's actually a four-way match. So it's going to be a four-way match for the next gen title, which is a little bit different. It's it's not like a you're just you're basically just qualifying for a four a fatal four-way. Um so by the end of this whole night, I completely forgot PJ PJ Black wrestled. Like they showed the brackets and showed that he advanced, and I was like, "Did they not show that match?" So I actually <laughs> com I actually completely forgot about it. But I thought this was here's some of the magic that I was talking about with most of these matches. The I don't know if you caught on this too. It seems like the action is boom, 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 boom. Like they're not walking around the ring and wasting time. Like the 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 action is is quick. So even if it was like a three-minute match, it would feel a lot longer because they don't waste any time. There's a very thin line between heel and babyface. And a lot of these matches were like babyface, babyface. But there's a very thin line to where it makes it seem like everyone is just a competitor. Everyone's a competitor on a level field. Nobody felt like a jobber in, in all four episodes. No one felt like an absolute superstar either necessarily. It just seemed like everybody had a was on a level playing field and had an opportunity to shine. I'd have to disagree with you just on one of those, but we'll, we'll get to that once we get to that match. Okay, no problem. <laughs> um, so uh, did you like this as an opening match for, for the, I mean, this is the very first match we're seeing in this Amp anthology. Did it, did it capture you? Did you like it? Yeah. Um, you know what? I'm, I'm, I'm a big uh, fan of like Exavision Cruiserweight Wrestling. And I feel like the way to start a show is when you have that that kind of match opening up, that's how you get you know the fans going and stuff. Where it's like, hey, we're gonna have a, a great show and stuff like that. But um, it was nice back and forth. Um, you know, it's cool to see what guys can do when given the opportunity outside of uh, different promotions and stuff. Because I remember Sonata being in TNA and 
his run, I mean, I, I think he was part of uh, James Storm's stable. And I think he had a, the X Division title for some time. But I feel like he really didn't, you know, really get to display what he was, you know, capable of doing and stuff. So here, you know, you saw, like, it's like, wow, you know. But, you know, nice back and forth. PJ Black got the win. Um, but, yeah, it really had me going. I was just like, all right, this is a good start to the pay-per-view. Yeah, and if I, th- I think I remember correctly, he did, he did a, a 450 splash off the ropes. Um, not off the turnbuckles, but uh, off the ropes. So this was, I thought it was pretty good. I've i have seen PJ Black wrestle in um, WWE, NXT, uh, Lucha Underground. Like, I've, I, even shows that I don't watch anymore, I've still, I've still seen all his stops. And he's getting to be a pretty good performer. Um, and this is from two years ago, but I mean, I just saw so much growth compared to when he was, you know, debuted years ago and they, he couldn't even talk. And later in this, he did a promo, which was pretty decent, but this was a good opening match. It was nine minutes long, very fast paced, very back and forth. And he didn't know who was going to win. And PJ Black ends up coming out and coming out on top. Uh, Kevin Cross cuts a promo after this, and we're going to get to the Kevin Cross and, and Bobby Roode match, but I was so sold on these promos. So what they were doing is they, they did video packages for everybody, which they're starting to do that on impact as well, but they do a video package, which makes everyone seem so much more important. And that's why the, the super X cup is working. Cause everyone gets their little promo package and it seems like, okay, this person is important as opposed to, you know, like the world title series last year where like, Hey, here's the, here's the eight participants. And, you know, like it was just a really <laughs> lackluster tournament. So these packages are really good. And the whole time watching this package, I was like, I have a feeling when I see Kevin Cross wrestle that I'm going to be like, why is he in, in the company now? Like he seemed that important, but we'll get to that. This was a part um, I didn't like at all. And Bobby Roode comes out and cuts a promo. So a lot of people were confused on why Bobby Roode was on these tapings when he was a TNA talent at the time. And he basically like was invading GFW. He was saying yeah. this was the best part. He goes, I'm a TNA guy. I always have been and always will be. So that was funny. But oh, yeah, yeah. I, I, I chuckled at that, too. I mean, look, <laughs> I understand, you know, people, you know, you know, things change and stuff like that. But uh, it's funny when you hear promos like that and stuff. So but I mean, it, it's all good. <laughs> yeah. So he, he came out and he cut this big promo where this is, you know, um, I'm I'm a TNA guy. I'm important. I'm gonna come here and win this global title, just because I want to. I thought the promo was a little long and excruciating. And as I talked to you offline, Robbie Roode just lacks charisma. I, I haven't seen his NXT work, and uh, I am on the bandwagon of saying his music is a lot of the reason he's where he's at. Not not all of it. That's not what I'm saying. I'm not saying he's a music guy. But music goes a long way with wrestlers, and I've followed Bobby Roode enough to know that his mic skills and charisma just isn't good. He's improved a lot, and he he'll try really really hard. He's not you know uh, he's not boring, but he 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 tries very hard. But towards the end, when you put him next to uh, James Storm with Beer Money, I mean every time James Storm opened his mouth, it was it was night and day listening to him and Bobby Roode talk. So I'm just not, I'm not one for long Bobby Roode promos. Magnus makes his way to the ring, Nick Aldis. And they've, when I looked at Magnus, the very first thing I said was, did you notice his physique compared to now? Um, You know, I, to, to be honest with you, I mean, I've never, I mean, it, it seems similar to now. I don't know. Maybe it's something that I'm missing. I mean, did he seem bigger here than he does now or vice versa? He, and, and this GFW, uh, on the amped episode, he was much more cut. Like he had a real defined six pack, um, much better shape than he appeared on impact. Okay. 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 Yeah. So, you know, he tried to say I'm a top guy and it makes sense watching this because he's obviously being positioned as the top baby face. Um, and it was working, you know, for, for a majority of it, you know, he, people were buying into it, but he's not a top guy anywhere. (laughs) <laughs> and, uh, but that's how he was being positioned in this company. So I can see when he came over with Jeff Jarrett, you know, he made a, uh, saying, Oh, I'm, they, uh, disrespected me with a contract offer and everything like, dude, he thinks he's top shit and he's not, he's, he's just not, this was all built over, um, 
the two of them. And uh, we'll get to the, the matches a little bit later. You but, know what uh, he might be a you know what he might be a product of? What's that? You know, um when you achieve so much so soon, like I think when he uh uh they put the world title on him, I thought they put it on him way too early and stuff. And I mean it kind of showed because his run, man, it had to be one of the worst uh world at least in my opinion, one of the worst title runs I, you know, can you know, remember and stuff like that. So, you know, with achieving that at a young age and stuff like that, and then you tend to think you're more than what you are now. And I don't think he's a bad wrestler. I think he's serviceable, but I mean, he's not somebody that I would make the face of a company. You know, if you want to have him mixing it up in the main event, he could be like, if you have your, your five main guys, he could be guy number five or guy number four, but to be the actual focal point, I just, I just don't see it with him. No, not at all. He's absolutely a mid-card guy. And actually, one thing I forgot to say about this promo, Congo Kong came down, feels like a much bigger monster than he feels on Impact. He took out Nick Aldis, and Bobby Roode locked him in the uh, crossface. All right, so then we get a, a tag match. I think you were saying you didn't really like this one. This is uh, Los Luchas. Which no, is... not this one. It was okay. the, the other one. The other okay, one. all right. So this was a six a trios match. So they were kind of ahead of the, ahead of their time here. With the uh, trios. But uh, it was a trios match of Los Luchas, which was Phoenix Star and Zocre. And Mysterioso Jr. versus Bestia 666, Blood Eagle, and Shamu Jr. This was a quick match. It was, you know, a little over six minutes long. But it was an example of something that felt like it was a lot longer than it was. Because the, the moves were, I mean, back and forth. And I saw some moves here that I hadn't seen before. So you were digging this match. Yeah, the, the, my, my only gripe, I'll say, just my only gripe, and I, I don't know if you could uh, uh, get this analogy. I just feel, and maybe it's just in Lucha matches as a whole, because even I see this in Mysterio matches a lot. I mean, it seemed like every other move was a Rana or a head scissors. Now, like I said, I, I like those moves and stuff like that, but, you know, I like variety and stuff. So it kind of felt like to me, like if you ever played a wrestling game and you got somebody spamming the same move, like I felt like every single move was some variation of a Rana or a head scissors and stuff. So I was just all like, I don't know if it was, you know, that was just part of the match, laziness, whatever. But I was just like, all right, like, OK, I've seen it do, do something else. But outside of that, man, that guy who stood out to me was that uh. You probably can pronounce his name better than me. That Bestia uh, uh, 666. Like, I wonder what that guy's doing. I think GFW should uh, bring him in. I, I liked his work. I, I think that the company has to jump on some of these Lucha guys. And I don't mean Lucha Underground, but I mean guys in AAA and Crash, which is a safe bet since they're partnered with him. Because I don't know any rumors, but common sense to me dictates that WWE's next tournament or not next one, but they're going to try to do a luchador one. That's common sense dictates that to me because they're trying to do everything. I think right now is a good time to jump on these guys because with the partnerships they have, this is a better time than ever to try to get a, a TV deal in Mexico because that is a that is a fan base that, that likes wrestling. They don't give a shit about Dixie Carter and Hulk Hogan. So, <laughs> you know, I think it's a good place for them. You know, I saw a picture of a crash pay-per-view or crash event yesterday, and it was... God, there had to have been 8,000 people there. I mean, it was uh, it was pretty impressive. I, I, to your point, I know what you mean. I used to watch Lucha Libre when I was a kid, and this is a Lucha Libre that people have no idea about today. But it was um, everyone had a mask, and everyone it was just it was a very small deal at the time. But it was just the same moves over and over and over and over up until the finish. So, um, what GFW I think what they need to do just moving forward is. They got to present themselves as a company that focuses on wrestling. That's it. That's all. Like the thing about it sometimes, and look, I don't, you know, knock anyone, you know, looking for other opportunities. If someone leaves a company and wants to go over to, you know, you know where and stuff like that, that's fine. But you, what, what I think some fans don't understand is what some, some of these wrestlers that go over there, you know, whether you go to NXT or whatever like that, some of them, they're wrestlers. That's it. They don't bring any kind of versatility. And what I mean by versatility is, you know, from my time when I used to watch WWE, 
I notice, you know, they tend to like the wrestlers who tend to get pushed or the big pushes are the guys and women who are able to, you know, not only wrestle and entertain, but show up on ESPN, show up on Good Morning America. They bring that versatility. That's what the company likes. So when, you know, you're saying, hey, such and such, you come here, such and such, you come here. A lot of these wrestlers, they train to be wrestlers. That's it. Like, yeah, you know, maybe to get a part in a movie deal or whatever like that. Like, that's cool and stuff. But their main focus is wrestling. So when you're telling some of these individuals to go over there and they have to go over there, you know, some of their personalities taken away from them where they're not able to be what got them, you know, recognized and stuff like that. So I think what GFW should do is like, and I'm I'm sure that's what they're doing, but, you know, market it as a company that, you know, we give you, you know, the opportunity to be yourself, you know, how you made a name for yourself you know, you can come here. We're giving you the platform to do that. It's up, it's up to you for you to, you know, swim or drown and stuff like that. I hate to use drowning, but you, you, you understand what I'm saying? No, I, I get it. Um, we go into episode two now, and it's uh, Kushida versus Virgil Flynn. So, uh, you know, impress, Kushida's impressive. And this Virgil Flynn, if you're not familiar with this dude, I wasn't until I watched this. He's about 5'4", <laughs> yeah. I think is what they build him at. And he's pretty impressive. Like, I would love to see this guy in the X Division right now. As I mean, he could really get people as like a as a strong fan favorite. I mean, this guy can work. This kid is, is he's pretty impressive. This was a great match. Now, all these matches, with the exception of like maybe two, were strong three-star matches. You know, there wasn't, they didn't give us, even if you didn't like a match, they didn't give us bullshit not a single time. Every single match was at least competitive not everyone there was one but i get the storytelling behind that one but yeah Kushida versus virgil flynn were you impressed by virgil flynn like i was um you know at first when i seen the match and when they i seen that they uh uh, dubbed him uh five four i was like wow i was like you know how's this gonna really work because that's essentially smaller than mysterio um yeah i I was impressed at first it, it seemed like the match it took a while for it to really kick into that gear but then finally when i was able to see what he was able to do i was like wow you know this guy could be somebody you know i could see mixing up in the next division however i think with someone that size and stuff and, and i could be wrong i hate to you know say oh this is someone's destined for they're destined for that for, but being that small i mean smaller than mysterio like he's you know pretty much i think in gfw he'd be like a, a life or x division guy but uh, for what he was able to do, like especially that uh, Frankenstein, that was that had me get up like, wow, damn. <laughs> yeah, he, you're right. He'd be he would be a life or X division guy, but he'd be very uh, reliable that you can just kind of plug in there when you need a ultimate X match or a multi man match, and he can make it exciting. Similar to if I had to compare him to somebody uh, to like Mandrews, Mandrews was just in there to be that. You know, like, the motherfucker was never going to win, you know, but he he at least was like, you just factor him. If he's in part of the match, it's going to be exciting type of thing. So that's what this guy could do. Virgil Flynn loses via tap out, and they really push that, oh, my God, this guy almost beat Kushida, who at the time was like the junior heavyweight champion or something in New Japan. So they really they really made it a big deal. Like, there's a lot of respect between the wrestlers after the matches and everything. You know, with, with the promos and, you know, the Kushida was like, I don't remember what he was saying. It was kind of broken English, but he was saying he's good or good competitor or something like that. So that was fun. That was that was one of my favorite matches. Yeah, it's a it's a cool it was, it was cool. Like, uh, um, and, you know, as you know, we're reviewing the other matches, you kind of see that a lot. Like, and it, that's one thing, you know, when you're talking about starting a new promotion, what you got to do, you got to do something that the ones that are already established aren't doing. And like, you know how, like you're saying with the show, and I, I noticed that too, there really, it seemed like everybody was like face-face, you know, matching up. So having that where at the end where there's that respect and stuff, that's something different because, you know, we're all trained, you know, trained to believe that here's a face, here's the heel, you know? So I thought like, you know, having that and Rashida giving him, you know, him his praise and stuff like that, it was cool. And like you said, with the earlier match um, with the PJ Black and uh, uh, Sonata, Everybody, it seemed like everybody was treated as an equal. I mean, all these matches, even with this match, you know, you didn't walk in thinking, oh, okay, this guy's totally going to get, you know, owned or something like that. Like, 
you know, the, it, it could go either way. So I thought that was pretty cool. So the main event for this one, this was the one match that, this was the one like two star match of this whole thing. But I get the storytelling and I've been excited to talk about it. This was Bobby Roode versus Kevin Cross. Now, Bobby Roode had been taking up a lot of promo time, you know, in the last show. And then Kevin Cross, his video packages, I guess he was like a UFC fighter. I mean, dude, they made it sound like this guy was is going to kick your ass if you get in the in the ring with him. I mean, he seemed like an absolute beast. And we get to this match. The winner of this match gets to be in the global title tournament. Um Needless to say, Bobby Roode wins this thing, and we don't know who his opponent is going to be yet. That's to be determined. That's the only bracket, part of the bracket that's no one knows what's going on yet. Now, this match, this was a squash match, but it was a six and a half minute squash match. So usually when you think squash match, it's like a two or three minute match. Bobby Roode kicked this guy's ass almost from the from the beginning of the bell to the very end. And the reason I like the storytelling with it was because we don't see long squash matches like that. And it felt really realistic because it's like, say you're watching UFC and a guy's getting his ass kicked. He's getting his ass kicked for like two or three rounds. Then finally, <laughs> he just finally loses. Like, I, this was just different to me. Because if this were on an episode of Raw or Impact, it would have been a two minute match. It would have just been rude. would just went up there. But this guy actually did put up a fight. But what happened is he injured his arm early on the ring post. And they sold that throughout the match. And then he tapped out. Because you know, like me, dude, in wrestling, someone will get injured. You know, they'll injure their leg. Their, the opponent is working on it the entire match. And then the injured wrestler ends up winning. <laughs> you know, like they never get the tap out <laughs> for on that injured. And so Kevin Cross got his ass, freaking ass kicked. And then they had a video package where he's just so disappointed at himself and every I mean it was it felt really realistic to me and it felt like this is what happens when you put a veteran like Bobby Roode in the ring with a rookie like Kevin Cross. Yeah, they did him a disservice. Like if there was one, like you know how I had said or earlier I said, you know, one person kind of seemed like they were per, uh, portrayed as a jobber. To me, it was him just because I felt like the video packages that they did with him, they made him seem like he's going to be, you know, a rising star within the company. Now, you know, going up against a veteran, you kind of have an idea like, well, normally the veteran is going to beat the rookie. But um, I, I think if they were really high on this guy, the way that they probably should have done it is um, you remember back in 2002 when Cena debuted? against Kurt Angle, and uh, mm -hmm. I, I, I think Kurt Angle got the win. Kurt, did Kurt Angle get the win? Do you remember? He, he, yeah, Kurt got the win. Okay, but it was competitive. I think if you would have, if they would have done it like that, then it's like, okay, you know, but it's like, I, I feel like they did uh, Kevin Kevin Cross a disservice because with the video packages and stuff like that, you know, having him perceive like, hey, this guy, you know, he can, you know, kick your ass and stuff. I just felt like Bobby Roode, you know, made easy work of him and stuff. And even though they had the video packages after of him being all disappointed, it was kind of like, you know, it, it, I don't know. For me, it felt flat. Yeah, I think we, I think it's just different different opinions there. I mean, for me. I've always wanted to see one of those matches where a rookie really just got their ass kicked. Um, I think one, this is an old match uh, when Cody Rhodes debuted with against a uh, Randy Orton a long time ago. It's kind of how that match was. It was like his first match and Randy Orton just destroyed him. All right. So um, episode three, we get the Bollywood boys, the Bollywood boys versus the Akbars. Uh, I should have talked about this at the top of the show. So uh, this is a good time for me to segue into it. Did you think when the GFW and Impact social media accounts were promoting this Amped Anthology that they focused entirely too much on the people currently in WWE? I don't think it was intentional. I think it was just a situation where, I mean, a bulk of their stuff kind of revolved around some of these guys. Like, you know, if you go and, you know, record record something, and, you know, the people are like, just say even with like with GFW, you could say like with the whole Al Patron situation, you know, they invested all that time and, you know, they recorded all those tapings of footage of him and he goes and, you know, gets, finds himself in trouble. Like, what can you do? You know, are you going to go back and scrap all that? You end up hurting the, the product. So I think with, 
you know, with these, uh, um, these tapings and stuff like that, well, the, uh, the amp anthology, like, you know, the Bollywood boys and Baru, like they had no idea. They can't, you know, pr uh, foresee the future and stuff like that. So I think they just figured like, Hey, this was the material they had. You know, these were the guys that were focused prominently on it. I mean, it is what it is. You know, there, there is, it's out of their control. You, am I making much sense? I get exactly what you're saying. I feel like there was enough people in the cards, though, that weren't WWE guys that um, they could have used their video packages as well. But yeah, if you actually watch this, you see that there was a lot of focus on the Bollywood boys. There was a lot of focus on um, the Kurt Hawkins dude. What is his name on this? Uh, I think it's Myers, isn't it? Brian Myers? Yeah, yeah, Brian Myers. So, And they pu they pushed him on there like he was a star, you know? So, I mean, it, it, that was how he was delivered on these. But the Bollywood boys... Um, they go against the Akbars, and the Akbars are stereotypical, like Iron Sheik. Mm -hmm. And the Bollywood boys are uh, more Americanized, and they've got pink trunks on and or boots on, furry boots and all. Um, this was okay, but the reason I was entertained by it is because it felt like an old school tag team match. I mean, it, it captured 1980s tag team wrestling to me to the T as far as just these two very unlikable heels and when i say unlikable i don't mean they had like a credible amount of heel heat but i mean there was no one cheering for them there they weren't like dead necessarily so um it was very old school wrestling in the fact that they were just continuing to work on this one guy and then he would mount a little comeback and go for the tag and just never quite get there so i thought they captured some old school magic with this and the bollywood boys are actually uh actually a pretty impressive team I don't, I don't know if they wrestle right now in WWE. I have no idea. But actually, they're not bad. These act bars, you know, they're definitely destined for independent wrestling. <laughs> there's, you know, there's no way you could put them on a on a TV. On, I guess for this it worked, but you couldn't put them on Impact or, uh, you know, they would come across like maybe like Fala Bar Mar and Mario Bokora at the best. So, what were you thinking here? Yeah, um, you know, my first impression was, and the thing that I did like is. It gave us, you know, you gave us because, you know, you gave us the, we've all seen in wrestling, the foreign, foreigner gimmick that's been, you know, played to death and stuff like that. But then you also gave us something different. Like, in other words, you know, anytime, you know, you have wrestlers of ethnic backgrounds, a lot of times, you know, they're always booked to play, you know, the evil foreigner or, you know, whatever. So you had the Akbars, you know, playing that, you know, everyone, you know, mistreats us, da, da, da. But then you have these guys who are of same descent, I think. And, uh, um, you know, party guys and stuff like that. So I like that. I mean, as for the match, I mean, this was one of the matches that kind of is kind of, eh, it didn't really do much for me. But uh, um, it was decent. You know, I think with the Bollywood boys, you know, I don't know what they're doing in uh, wherever they're at now and stuff like that. But you could see, like, that what they were going to be the focal point moving forward within GFW. You know, they were going to be the premier tag, tag team. Well, that's the vibe that I got. Yeah, they definitely were, and it, it was nice, like you said, they, they did something different with them. Even in the promos, they're like, hey, we're we're from India, but you're not going to see us with, you know, Indian garb or, or whatever it is on. And I think now, like, they're called the Singh Brothers, so they basically took the most popular possible Indian name, and uh, they did exactly what you said. They just, they basically played up to their ethnicity for the gimmick, and... That's not how this was. This was more like focusing on Bollywood and the and the the pride of you know being Indian and everything. And I liked it. And uh, you know that they, they definitely were being positioned as the, as the top tag team, and they they did a good job. And, and it was a pretty pretty good match. And um, they had a real nice finisher. Uh, I forgot what it was exactly. I, I know that it was. Um, it was a two-part move that had a f elbow drop from the top, but I forgot what the move was before that. I don't know if you remember it or not. Yeah, no, I, I it's, <laughs> I'm drawing a blink. I just, I don't know. I thought it was kind of cool, but um, then after that, this was maybe the best match on this whole thing, actually. I, I know I, earlier I said Kushida and Virgil Flynn, but we get um. Oh, actually, no, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm looking at my notes. We just got a video package. It was for Sanjay versus Jigsaw. Uh, and that's for the next episode. The um, 
The next match that we get, and and we got a Karen Jarrett promo here, and it wasn't as bad as the Impact ones. Um, it helps because this crowd was way bigger and way way livelier. And if you could hear compared to Impact, how the Impact announcers are very loud. Like this was much more um, compressed as far as the volume of the announcers fit the volume of the crowd very well. So the uh, it was just easier to listen to than Impact. But we get the uh, GFW. So the reason the way they're doing their women's tournament is they have two three way matches, um, and then I think the two winners of the three way have a title match. So the first one is Mickey James, Christina Von Erie, and uh, Lady Tappa, Lady Tappa, and she's got her husband with her. And they cut a promo in the beginning, and Karen Jarrett comes out. It's real, real paint by numbers, but but it wasn't too bad. I mean, Karen had a nice line saying, "I I don't need my husband to do the talking for me," which you know, Lady Tappa, her husband is out there doing the talking for her. So that thought that was cool. This wasn't one of the better matches. Um, but Lady Tappa, you know, I hadn't seen her in so long. She's a pretty imposing figure. She's a big girl. Uh, you know, and I thought they played um, to her strengths very well. And, you know, the beginning of the match was a bunch of double teams. I just, I thought it was kind of silly when Christina Von Erie and Mickey James did like a high 10, you know, double high five and then started wrestling. Because they said earlier they didn't know each other <laughs> in the in the promo packages. So it seemed like they were friends all of a sudden. So what do you think about this one? Uh, this, you know, we actually got to see Christina Von Erie's on Impact twice, and she looks really bad both times. Uh, did you think anything more of her watching this? Uh, my only thing, my only takeaway. I mean, she was decent. I just that finisher of hers that she did. While it's impressive, I the first thing I was thinking is like, man, your knees are gonna go out on you soon, man. Because it just, you know, how sometimes some some moves that you know a wrestler performs or a wrestler takes. You know, there's a shelf life of it. You know, you do it so much. Like, I can't. There's one particular move. Oh, okay. Um, CM Punk, when he used to do the uh, Pepsi plunge. Are you familiar with that maneuver? Oh, okay. We're pretty much, it's a pedigree from off the top rope. Okay. And uh, I remember reading in an interview, they, you know, they asked him why he stopped doing it. And he was saying, you know, it was a lot on his knees and stuff. So her, uh, Christina Von Eri, I think her finisher, it's like uh, she crosses the opponent's arms and then it's like she delivers a backstabber off the turnbuckle. It, it's, it's, it's a neat move and stuff like that. But, uh, you know, that was just my one thing. I was just all like, you know, she's decent. But that finisher, man, you know, she's going to end up, her knees are going to end up uh, betraying her soon, man. So and especially when a big person's taking that move, like Lady Tapia taking that move. You know, that, that was just one of my takeaways. But, you know, it was a decent, decent match and stuff. I mean, I like the fact that it seems they were giving the young upstart, even though I know she had been wrestling for a while, an opportunity over, you know, we've seen, you know, far too many occasions where the veteran, you know, the person who's accomplished things elsewhere, you know, gets the opportunity before the young upstart. So I like that, you know, that she was given that, you know, the opportunity to win in advance. Yeah, I think he was, she was the last person people expected to actually win that match. And and you're and yeah, you're right. That finisher, um, not only is it taxing on the body and probably hurts just as much to her as does the opponent, especially since she did it on Lady Tappa. Um, it's not believable. Yeah, <laughs> you know because the person always like gives her part of the arm, and it's it's just it's not believable, even a little bit. I expect the match to be a little bit better just because of Mickey James's inclusion, but. She hit her DDT on Lady Tappa, and it looked like crap. <laughs> and I've always thought Mickey James's DDT was one of the shittiest, uh, shittiest ones in the business. I, I've never liked it. It was never believable. You know, I, I remember she had the kick, the chick kick, and then, um, man, she had like one that's called like Long Kiss Goodnight or something. It was like she would kiss the opponents on the mouth. You know, that's back when she kind of had a stalker gimmick. Yeah. And that movie, was, that movie was really cool, but her DDT freaking sucks. And this was probably the worst it's ever looked. I mean, of course, like oh, I don't think she got all of it. But the crappy thing was that DDT is what got Christina Von Erie the win. Because she hit the DDT and then CVE threw her out of the ring and then hit her finish. So the finish of this was super flat for that reason. She hit the finisher good, but like you said, that there's a shelf life with that finisher. I mean, you look at Alberto now does it. He he gets like five percent of it at almost every time he does it. It's it's you know it used to be impressive, and now I just don't think he's uh 
at his age can do that move anymore. But Christina Von Erie does win and she advances in a tournament and promises to win the whole thing. So before the, the match earlier where the uh, Akbars took on the Bollywood boys, there was this like singer in the ring, starts singing America Beautiful and it was terrible. But he was like, had this gimmick of this like cheesy Vegas singer. And there's an, there's a backstage promo after this where he comes up to uh, Magnus and this guy's pretty funny. And he goes, uh, Hey, Nick Aldis, love the name. Throw another shrimp on the Barbie, like making fun of his accent. And then he lets him know that he's Congo Kong's manager. And I like the dynamic of that, that he's got that real cheesy, um, uh, Vegas gimmick, and then he's Congo Kong's manager. So, next we get episode four. This is the last one. Sanjay J- Sanjay Dutt versus Jigsaw. This was the best I've ever seen Sanjay wrestle. To me, I thought this match was so good. I actually thought he was gonna win. He actually ended up losing because uh, I know he ended up winning the GF the uh, the uh, next gen title down the road. But he took on Jigsaw. I know Jigsaw had some time with TNA. I don't remember how long ago or how long. But he's a he's a pretty impressive worker, and this match, I think this was this was that straight like X division style match that we like. And Sanjay looked great. Sanjay right now has, isn't getting over on TV because he's just not getting a crowd reaction. But I thought this one match was killing it. Do you like this one? Yeah, you know, and I was comparing, you know, Sanjay. You know, my my first impression was I was comparing Sanjay uh, in this compared to what he does on TV now. And I don't know, if you, tell me if you agree or disagree. Does it feel like he lost a step a little bit? Yeah, he's two two different wrestlers. I thought the main event on Impact this last week looked like the old Sanjay, but previous to that, um, no. Yeah, yeah, but uh, um, yeah, it, it, it was great. I think it was one of my favorite matches out of all, you know, all the episodes and stuff. You know, nice x Division, well, x Division style, I should say. And that, that's what I was saying with the uh, next-gen belt. I don't know how it was portrayed, but I always figured when I seen the people who were competing for it, I was like, this is going to be GFW's uh, X Division and stuff. But uh, um, yeah, nice back and forth. I mean, I thought Sanjay was going to get the win, but uh, that Jigsaw guy, he did compete in TNA for a little bit. I don't know where he's competing now, but I remember there was a strong uh, following for him to you know, get signed by the company, but I don't know what happened. But yeah, it was great. I, I liked it. Especially, I like that finisher that uh, um, I forgot what he called it, but uh, uh, it looked pretty cool. The the jig and tonic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was like it's, it, <laughs> it looks kind of like a I want to say like a reverse pile driver. I I I mean I'm bad with the wrestling the actual move names of wrestling moves, but uh, it looked pretty cool though. It looks safe too. <laughs> yeah, it, it's a little similar to Ken, Kenny Omega's finisher, and then uh, there was. Um, I think it's Drago or uh, no, I think it's Phantasma. He does a very similar move too. So yeah, you're right. Um, you're right. Yeah, it, it was it was it was cool. This was this is the match. Um, I think people definitely have to check out because this was this was like Sanjay in his prime. I mean, he the, the, it's what you want the X division to be. I know there's there's a, a plan for the next gen title to come to GFW Impact now, but I don't think it's going to be the X division. I think it's going to be a mid card title. Because even with that next gen, I know it's you can still use that as a mid card, like you know, uh, as far as building your way up to the global title. So I think it could work. Cause like the grand championship is not a good. I like the title, but it's not a good mid card title. So, but I feel like though, um, if they do away with it, like my my suggestion would be like this. Because the thing with the X division, and I know, um, I'm sure, I think we talked about this before on Twitter. But for me, my opinion, the X division. It's the it's a cruiserweight division. I mean, I don't care, you know, how they try to push it, no limits and stuff. Majority of the guys who compete or have won the belt have been guys that you could see winning the cruiserweight title, the WCW cruiserweight title, mind you. But so right. and I mean, I know in between you had Samoa Joe win and you had Abyss win, you had Lashley win. I think you could bring the next gen belt merge it together and i mean if you want to go with next gen or whatever that's fine i think with the grand title i feel like you know with in this this stems back to when they were tna 
there's been so much inconsistency with a mid card belts with the company where I feel like they got to kind of get one and roll with it. Like I was fine with the King of the Mountain belt. I thought like that was perfect, especially when uh, Eli Drake had it. He was gold with that belt. So they keep mm. scrapping belts. And then now with the grand championship, I just think they've invested too much where if they scrap that, I mean, it's, you know, you have to eventually establish a mid-card belt. I think it's the rules that do the championship a disservice. And I think they can tweak around it if they, if you know, they wanted to. But I just think, just my opinion, like, if they take it away and they scrap it entirely, then you're going back to square one. I mean, there's only, what, f- four people have only ho- held a grand championship. You need to kind of, uh, uh, you know, establish it a little bit more and stuff like that where you got, you know, various people holding it. So it, it seems like a legitimate belt you know, your mid card belt towards the world title. That's just my take on it all. Dutch Mantel had said that they're going to tweak that title. And uh, I think with EC3 holding it, and since there's been like faulty finishes and faulty judge things, I think it's all the start of the storytelling to how they're going to tweak that. That's my opinion. But um, I think it's a good title and they should keep it. I just don't think it's a good mid card title. I, I think they could get away with uh, adding the next gen on top of that, I guess is what I'm saying, and make the Grand Championship kind of its own division. But So last match we get in this entire anthology is uh, Nick Aldis versus Congo Kong. And if this match were on impact, people would turn the TV off. It, you, you know what I'm saying? Like As far as like if they were like, hey, the, the main event is Congo Kong versus Magnus, people would be like, no. There's no way that's the Impact main event. This match was a lot better than expected because they've been positioning Magnus. I'm going to keep calling him that as pretty much the top baby face in the company. So, you know, the crowd was getting behind him. Kongo Kong was portrayed as a better monster than, than he's portrayed on Impact. And uh, they had a near fall at this at one point that uh, Magnus hit the... Uh, he did a superplex on Congo Kong, which got a huge crowd reaction. That was amazing. And then uh, then he hit the top rope elbow, and Congo Kong kicked out. So that was a really good example of great, pla- great placement for a near fall. And another thing that happened in this match was Congo Kong went for a moonsault yes. and, miss- and missed it. So that was pretty impressive. Uh, he can do a lot more in the ring than we realize. I and mean, we already can see he's kind of a high flyer for his size. But, you know, did you feel like Kongo Kong was, was is being better portrayed as a monster here in these episodes than we see him on TV? Um, I think, like, if, you know, watching this for the first time, right, and, like, say if I wasn't keeping up with uh, Impact, I would see this guy and wonder, like, okay, well, this guy's a big deal. I think... You know, with Impact, he kind of got stuck in the storyline with uh, um, Laura Van Ness and stuff. So that kind of has, uh, you know, has him trapped and stuff. I really think if they invest the time in him, you can, you know, have him dance around in the main event. Because that's one thing I think Impact's uh, missing is a, a mon- that monster heel, you know, a straight up monster guy. And um, in here, you could see, like, he was going to be positioned in GFW as that monster guy. Kind of, I want to say, like, a Circa Abyss, you know, in the uh, mid-2000s. Like, I feel like you need that, you know. And uh, um, not everyone should be able to be able to superplex him and do all these moves to him. And, you know, with them positioning uh, Aldis to do that, that's kind of reassured me that they were making a big deal out of Aldis. But... Yeah, just to answer your question, I think, you know, if they're going back and watching this, they should really take notes. And, and I mean, I know Congo Kong's a, a little bit, you know, getting up there in age and stuff, but, uh, you know, he can work, you know, let him do his stuff. You know what I mean? Like, he's pretty big and athletic. He's not your typical, you know, big monster guy. He can do some things. I mean, and that moonsault, like, a lot of big guys, when they tend to do the moonsault, it's like sideways or it's just all, you know. Like Moose does it. Yeah, yeah. Or like even I, I think of like, uh, you know, the late Bam Bam Bigelow where his was kind of to the side. I don't know if that's just how he would do it. But with Congo Kong, he did it just straight up, you know. So, you know, give him the opportunity and stuff like that. You know, they got 
they they need to start what and I, I hate to just you know keep going back and forth to impact when we're covering this but i think what impact needs to start doing is realizing the talent that they have and start you know elevating some of these guys because you got the talent there give us some new faces and stuff like that you know mixing it up and he he seems more than capable of doing it but you know like you said you know i had this been you know an impact main event you know people might have poo-pooed on it um it was fine to me i liked it yeah, and he missed that moonsault, and that's how at the end he lost the match. He missed the moonsault, and then um, all this hits, uh, I don't know what he calls it, the urinage or something like that. He hits a move that Eli Drake does as a uh, regular move. Yeah, it's a, and, uh, it's a um, I don't know the actual name, but uh, I, I always dub it because uh, Mark Jindrak used to use it as, he used to call it the Marka Excellence, where it's a backdrop into a rock bottom. Yeah. Yeah. So that's how he ended up winning the match, and I mean, we get Kongo Kong losing for his very first match on this whole thing. <laughs> so, but, um, you know, the point was to make Aldis look strong. And I feel like this would have been a good finals match instead. But, um, you know, have Kongo Kong run through some competition. But the, uh, the tournament, the global tournament looks pretty cool. Most of these matches are tournament based. I mean, uh, you know, on this anthology. But I thought it was a very easy, you know, close to three hours to watch. Um, you know, the video packages seeing him twice kind of hurt it and uh you know they did some in-ring promos but they weren't they weren't too bad like i said i wasn't a big fan of bobby roods just because uh i like bobby Roode a lot you know i've always liked him i just you know just not the most charismatic guy charismatic guy um so yeah what would you give a uh, if i had to put you on a spot would you give this out of 10 on the 10 rating um a good seven and a half um i like you know, the idea, it felt different. I like, um, you know, the audience and stuff like that. And um, it looked like what they were gearing towards, the idea that they had, it would have given us something different. And, you know, it's a damn shame that they weren't able to, you know, land a TV deal because I think that would have been awesome to have, you know, the three brands and stuff where, you know, wrestling fans can switch through because I feel like they were giving us something that, you know, neither at the time, you know, when you can think back to 2015, neither TNA or WWE was giving, you know, wrestling fans. So, it, you know, it was different and stuff, but I, I enjoyed it. Um, I, f I fully believe this would have been a clear cut number two promotion if this was on TV. I don't know how he couldn't. I mean, right now he's doing so much magic with the company and getting them deals left and right. Like, how did he not get this on TV? Maybe it's because. He had an established, you know, coming over to the TNA side was an established brand with established overseas deals and things like that. It wasn't a startup, but I, I, I was, I was really shocked with this. I thought it was good. I thought it was better than anything on TV. And part of the reason I named my podcast King of the Mountain is because I always wanted to cover GFW if it, if they able <laughs> were able to get on TV. And now I am. So, um, that's gonna do it for us. You got anything else to say about the, uh, the amped? Um, yeah, it was just a great show, and I mean, I look forward to seeing the next set. This Amped is what wrestling needs. It, it, it really is. And uh, if they're able to achieve 75% of that on Impact, if they're able to figure it out, um, the future is very bright because I, I, I fully believe in this. If that was Jeff Jarrett's vision, what we saw, I fully believe on where he's going to take the company. I don't think I've ever really said this. I think they do got to get out of the Impact Zone. Um try to find a uh, another permanent home because they have a hard time filling the impact zone the way they need to and it it's not necessarily because of the product there's just there's a lot of wrestling in Orlando with NXT obviously being the big dog there and there's shine and there's all sorts of indie promotions and you got to find a place where you know let let's try to film TV here and uh make this uh, maybe a, a new home or just an alternate impact zone yeah it, um, it, it's you know what i think it's kind of like their safe haven because and i think the importance with you know them doing the house shows and seeing the crowds that they're bringing that lets them know like i'm sure you know with the past house shows in new york that lets them know like if they ever decided to do uh uh, um, uh, impact taping out in New York, I think Staten Island or wherever they had the house shows, they know there's a crowd there. I think that that's just the fear because, you know, if they just go to, you know, 
I'll just say like some part of Arizona or something like that. What if there's not a lot of GFW fans out there? So they're, you know, they have the show and stuff like that. And there's not, they don't draw, you know, a decent size enough crowd. And I think the impact zone provides kind of like, it's like a safety net for them because they kind of have an idea of the amount of people they're going to um, get, you know, at per taping and stuff like that. But I agree with you. They eventually they're going to have to just take the risk, just take baby steps, maybe find a venue where maybe it just fills 200 people, so to speak, or whatever the case may be. And, you know, take take those chances and stuff like that, you know, but. Yeah, Ring of Honor has TV shows where there's 200 people in the crowd, and just the way they format them around the ring, it, it works. They get away with it. So, um, you know, I've said on the podcast before, it's just a matter of them looking at their numbers, their analytics, their viewerships, and saying, okay, these are our hot spots where we can do TV, you know, um, and that's very, very easy, doable, very easy to do. So, um, thanks for swinging by and checking out the first of uh, One Pod Only. Subscribe to the channel. We're going to be doing this every month. we got three more Amped anthologies to go. I really like Amped. I like the Amped Army thing they're doing. So if they ever are able to do a second show, which is in the distant future, I think Amped is perfect for it. And, um, yeah, so we're going to keep talking one night only every month. And uh, I would imagine December is going to be a standard one night only. It might be kind of boring, but... Here's here's to hoping 2018 is uh, big for one night only. So uh, thanks for checking us out for Row the Great. This is BQ, and we will talk to you guys later. Peace.